We tend to forget about the humble battery, the power source that's in every electronic device that's not wired to the mains. It's the power and the Achilles heel of electric vehicles. It's the thing that runs out a day after using your Apple Watch, and yet it provides a backup to the grid and makes solar farms so far more useful when the sun goes down. Battery technology has come a long way in the last 40 odd years. When I was a kid, we only had carbon batteries for our toys and lead acid batteries for cars and trucks to start them, not to make them move, except in milk floats. It's only since the 1990s that lithium batteries have been available commercially, although they were first demonstrated in 1976, and they have transformed portable electronics. Without them, the things like our modern smartphones, tablets, and a whole range of portable computing devices either would not exist or would be nowhere near as thin and as lightweight as they are now, and the modern EV just wouldn't be here at all. But there is a problem with chemical batteries. If they are single-use ones, their lifetime is usually very limited unless they are lithium-based and used with low-power electronics. If they are rechargeable ones, then they need to be recharged on a regular basis. And the faster you charge and discharge them, the shorter their life becomes. But what if we could produce batteries that had a different type of electrical generation, ones which were not limited to chemical processes, batteries that could last for 50 or even 100 years or more before they needed to be replaced? If this could be achieved, then it would revolutionize the Internet of Things, space travel, human medical procedures and robotics. The type of batteries we're talking about are nuclear power batteries, also called atomic batteries, although they aren't really batteries, but generators, because they don't have any chemical reactions in them to create electrical power. This phenomenon was first discovered in 1913 by Henry Moseley, when he demonstrated that an electrical current could be generated by charged particle radiation. These generators rely upon the decay of radioactive elements to generate an electrical current, either indirectly by heat, working on thermoelectric generators, or directly using the particles released, acting on semiconductors, similar to how light generates power with a solar cell. Now, most of nuclear physics would not be where it is today without heroes like Einstein. And our sponsor today features Einstein and many others in the new online strategy game, Heroes of History, where you get to shape history from the Stone Age onwards by building your own civilization. Einstein is your guide, as well as one of the heroes you can collect. Although I'm still in the Bronze Age, I did get William Tell, a three-star hero, but I can't wait to get my first four and five-star ones. Not only do you build up your city from a Stone Age village by building up homes, farms, and infantry barracks to collect treasures, food, and rewards, but you engage your enemies in battles to collect more and upgrade your team's and hero's abilities. And you even get antimatter capsules that power the portal. The portal is what summons new and exciting heroes to join you and help you progress through the ages. But because of the uncertainty principle, you don't know who they'll be until they arrive, which keeps you on the edge of your seat. Each hero has their own class, role, and color, and that affects how they battle. Use these qualities when you're strategizing and battling other tribes, as well as Nikola Tesla, who is trying to upset time by bringing heroes from the future, and it's up to you to stop him and his maniacal machines. This is a real-time game that plays right in your browser with super smooth graphics, and you can shut it down at any time and come back and your position in the game will be exactly as you left off, ready for you to continue. It's engaging and pulls you in as your civilization grows and you collect new and exciting heroes. And with constant updates and multiplayer action, there's always something new to enjoy each month. Start building your civilization today by downloading Heroes of History using the link now showing and in the description below. And let's see who your heroes will be. We've already had nuclear generators in spacecraft in the form of RTGs or radioisotope thermoelectric generators. These have powered all the space probes which have visited the outer planets and beyond because normally there is just too little sunlight for solar panels to work efficiently at these distances. Radio isotopes like uranium and plutonium are very power dense. A 20 gram pellet of uranium, about 
half the height of an AA battery, has the same energy as a ton of coal, or 450 litres of crude oil, or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. Radioactive elements like uranium and plutonium release alpha, beta and gamma radiation. This is surrounded by a thermoelectric generator, basically layers of dissimilar materials which when heated generate an electrical current. The ones on the Voyagers 1 and 2 had three RTGs, each one containing about 4.5 kilograms of plutonium-238 and 312 silicon germanium thermoelectric couples, generating approximately 157 watts of power each, which halves every 87.7 years, the half-life for plutonium-238. The total electrical power when launched was 470 watts, but today is approximately half that. But with power conservation strategies like turning off unwanted equipment, it may be able to supply enough power to return engineering data back to Earth until 2036, a total of 59 years. But this technology has also been used a lot closer to home. In fact, in the 1970s, French and US companies developed nuclear power cells using plutonium for pacemakers, which worked in a similar way to create heat, which was then turned into an electrical current and embedded into people's chests to give a trigger to people with irregular heartbeat problems. Now you may well think, how can you put a radioactive substance like plutonium actually inside someone's chest and not cause them any harm? Well, this was done by surrounding a tiny amount of plutonium with layers of shielding material, so there was very little radiation release. Both alpha and beta particle radiation can be blocked by thin layers of aluminium or hydrogen rich materials. But this made them larger and heavier than normal non-nuclear versions. The unit's electronics were embedded in epoxy resin and the hard titanium case was designed to withstand any credible event including gunshots or cremation. The reason for doing this was that at the time it was thought they could last for decades and never need replacing thus saving on operations. Back in the 2000s, there were still people alive who had these implanted in the 70s and 80s. When they died, their pacemaker should be removed and sent to Los Alamos where the plutonium would be recovered. They stopped being used because the costs and technological advantages of lithium cells and low power electronics meant that plutonium power devices were just too expensive to use and dispose of. It was also realised that having to replace the battery maybe every 10 or 15 years would give a chance to upgrade the unit to something which would be more efficient, smaller and cheaper, rather than leaving decades old technology. There are also several other ways to harness radiation emitted, and one of these is called radiovoltaic conversion. These can work on alpha, beta or gamma radiation. Beta voltaics, which work on beta particles, were also used in pacemakers in the 1970s. The main advantage that these had over plutonium-based ones was they used a non-thermal process to generate electricity. These convert the electron-hole pairs produced by an ionizing trail of beta particles as they traverse a semiconductor. These are particularly well suited to low power applications where very long life of the energy source is required. Although they were used in some pacemakers in the 70s, they were phased out as cheaper lithium batteries became more well developed. The early semiconducting materials were also inefficient at converting electrons from beta decay into current, requiring a more hazardous use of isotopes. But in the last six or seven years, new types of semiconductors have been developed, which are much more sensitive and allow for less radioactive isotopes to be used. Applications such as spacecraft requiring power for decades and possible trickle charging of conventional batteries in consumer electronics like cell phones or laptops and powering remote scientific instrumentation. In 2024, Chinese company BetaVolt announced a miniature device that allegedly generates 100 microwatts of power at 3 volts with a lifetime of 50 years and used either carbon-14 or nickel-63. These could be made into coin-sized cells, and as it decays, it turns into a stable version of a non-radioactive copper-63. So when it's disposed of, it's no longer a hazard to the environment. Because they are single-cell generators, they can be stacked either in series to increase their voltage or in parallel to increase the current, or in a combination of both to 
create larger capacity generators. That their main use will be to power devices which are installed in places which are very difficult to get at and would be cost prohibitive to replace and could run for decades. This will become ever more prevalent with the Internet of Things, like sensors embedded into complex systems in remote areas with no external power, which allow them to communicate over the Internet without the need to replace the batteries. But what about powering things like cars and drones? Well, the problem here is that although radioisotopes like plutonium and uranium are incredibly energy dense, easily into the millions of times more energy dense than fossil fuels, when you're talking about very small pieces of them, the amount of energy they give off is really quite small. Then there is the conversion of the radiation into a direct current that will be used to power a motor, for example. All current nuclear battery technology, be that RTGs or beta voltaic batteries, have an efficiency of between about 2 and 8%, which is a lot less efficient than an internal combustion engine at 18 to 20%. Conventional nuclear fission reactors have a thermal efficiency of between 33 and 37 percent, but newer, very high temperature designs can achieve as high as 45 to 50 percent, making them far more efficient than the technology used in nuclear batteries. Something else that you can't do with a nuclear battery is to increase or decrease the power based on the rate of radioactive decay. That is fixed by nature and cannot be changed or even stopped. Unlike an internal combustion engine where you can carry a relatively small amount of fuel around with you and then just top it up as you go along, for a car to use a nuclear battery, you would need to have all the fuel available from the very beginning. It would be a bit like buying a diesel car and towing a tanker behind you with 30,000 litres of fuel, even if you only wanted to nip down to the supermarket. If you want more power from an atomic or nuclear battery, then you have to have more radioactive material. And the more you have, the more the problem becomes of radiation shielding, which becomes large and heavy. So when we look at it from this point of view, atomic or nuclear batteries are only really useful when you want low power in an inaccessible place for very long periods of time, like on a spacecraft or at the bottom of the ocean, or tiny sensors and transmitters in very remote, inaccessible places, but not for anything requiring a high current draw and rapidly changing power outputs. So your electric car won't be getting a nuclear battery upgrade anytime soon unless we can find a vastly superior way of converting radiation into electricity. So thanks for watching and don't forget to thumbs up, share and subscribe, and don't forget to check out Heroes of History. It's free to download and a lot of fun to play.